Welcome to Sunday School for January 1st, 2023. I do not own the rights to this music. This is Sunday School for ages 25 and older and ages 18 to 24. Please have pen and paper ready to write down today's notable scriptures to answer today's questions and to write down the daily home Bible readings for the week. Today's topic is Christ's love for the church. The Bible basis is coming out of Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 21 and ending at chapter 6, verse 4. The Bible truth, family members should love and care for one another just as Christ loves and cares for the church. Memory verse, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And that's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. The lesson aim, by the end of the lesson, we will compare Christ's love for the church with the relationships among family members. Appreciate Christ's sacrifice to show love and care for the church and accept responsibility for showing love in the family as Christ demonstrated love for the church. Our lesson overview. Life need for today's lesson. To treat our family members with the love of Christ. The Bible learning. To learn that God has standards for each member of the family. The Bible application to know that we are to respect and love each one of our family members. Students' responses. Students will demonstrate the love of Christ to the members of their families. Our lesson scripture. I will read both the King James Version and the Amplified Version. Beginning at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The Amplified Version of Ephesians, chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. Being subject to one another, out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands, as a service to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, himself being the savior of the body. 
But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives should be subject to their husbands in everything, respecting both their position as protector and their responsibility to God as head of the house. Husbands, love your wives, seek the highest good for her, and surround her with a caring, unselfish love, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word of God, so that in turn he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy, set apart for God, and blameless. Even so husbands should and are morally obligated to love their own wives as being in a sense their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own body, but instead he nourishes and protects and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members, parts of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined, and be faithfully devoted to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery of two becoming one is great, but I am speaking with reference to the relationship of Christ and the church. However, each man among you, without exception, is to love his wife as his very own self, with behavior worthy of respect and esteem, always seeking the best for her with an attitude of loving kindness, and the wife must see to it that she respects and delights in her husband, that she notices him and prefers him and treats him with loving concern, treasuring him, honoring him, and holding him dear. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, that is, accept their guidance and discipline as his representatives, for this is right, for obedience teaches wisdom and self-discipline. Honor, esteem, value as precious your father and your mother, and be respectful to them. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may have a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive. Nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of them, but bring them up tenderly with loving kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The biblical definitions for today's lesson are submit and provoke, submit, to voluntarily cooperate, assume responsibility, and carry a burden, provoke, to rouse to wrath, exasperation, or anger. Light on the word. The verse is found in Ephesians chapter 5 beginning at verse 21 and ending at chapter 6, verse 4, comprise what is called a household code. These statements were often broken down into discussions of husband and wife, father and children. The codes were developed by the philosophers of the day and delineated a group's belief on how the head of a household should lead his family. At the time, Paul wrote Ephesians. Many Romans were concerned that religions such as Judaism and Christianity would negatively influence traditional Roman family values. To allay these fears and show their support for these values, Christians, Jews, and other religious groups would often employ a standard form of statements. The introduction says, a spirit-filled life is one submitted to others. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul calls on believers to live out a life of holiness in relation to the world around them. He challenges them to live wisely, 
being led by the Spirit. A Spirit-led life will produce a believer who is becoming more like Christ every day. As we become more like Christ, we will learn to respect and submit to others in love and humility, and that the foundation of family relationships is to be modeled after Christ's love for the church. Lesson point one, reflecting Christ's authority over the church. Ephesians chapter five, verse 21, is a general instruction to all believers to submit to one another in love. This principle is directly associated with verse 18, where Paul instructs believers to be filled with the Spirit. When we are living a Spirit-led life, God gives us the grace to live in an attitude of humility and submission to others. The relationship of the wife to her husband is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. Paul addresses the wives first. He instructs wives to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord. The word submit in this verse means to yield one's rights or to cooperate. This word does not imply slavish obedience or being silent in the home. Though the household codes of ancient days often required a wife to obey her husband, Paul does not make this a requirement. Rather, he appeals to a wife's dedication to God as a basis for submission to her husband. In other words, when a wife honors and respects her husband, she is submitting to God and is planned for the family. In verse 23, Paul explains why a wife is to submit to her husband because he is the head of the wife and family, just as Christ is the head of the church. Christ was appointed by God to be the head of the church. On the basis of this authority, the church is to submit to him. Some people might conclude from these verses that there is an inequality between males and females, but Paul makes clear that in Christ all are equal. Notable scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 8 through 12 and Galatians chapter 3 verse 28. Within this equality, however, order and respect for authority should exist. It is within this context of understanding that the word submission sets an agenda for reverence to God and his divine principles. This is done as a means to cultivate a submissive spirit, which values and seeks to unselfishly support, love, and respect others for the sake of Christ. Thus, Paul laid this framework for his teaching regarding the marriage relationship and true harmony in the home. Paul underscored how a husband and a wife, through devotion for the sake of Christ, must dutifully exercise love and respect for each other in a marriage relationship. Paul primarily illustrated the quality of the nature of relationships that should exist between husbands and wives. When he drew on the an analogy of Jesus Christ and the church, the key verb submit from the Greek connotes an understanding of a voluntary placing under or ordering oneself under a leader or an authority source. The contextual meaning of the word head in verse 23 of this passage in reference to a husband's relationship with his wife has generated different interpretations among scholars. While some claim that head denotes an idea of a source, others choose to explain it as portraying leadership. The former source carries an understanding of delegated authority from a higher being or power, which must be exercised with great responsibility and knowledge. In other words, it does not imply that the wife should act like a slave and be a mindless person in the relationship. The latter, leadership, 
which seems to be the most probable interpretation of head in this context, has its foundation on the ability to provide good leadership. This is accomplished by loving others who are followers. We love them by listening to and respecting them. We also love them by carrying out given responsibilities in a manner that takes into consideration the feelings of others. We assess their strengths and weaknesses. Thus, a wife, out of love and humility, submits to the husband. In conjun conjunction, the husband must seek the holistic welfare of his wife and the entire household. He does this out of reverence for God and the position God has given him. This is because Jesus Christ, expressed as the head of the church, exercises his preeminence, supremacy, and authority as the leader of the church. Jesus Christ helps the church to overcome evil forces and elements within, within or without that seek to undermine God's purpose for his people. Our first question, why are believers commanded to submit to one another? Write down your answers. Light on the word. The key word in this text is submission, and it lays a framework for a discussion on how to discharge Christian duties and dynamic relationships of mutuality in an act of true Christian spirituality. This idea put forth in the text suggests the potential danger that individualism poses against a true community life or fellowship. It becomes very serious when individualism is expressed without an intentional desire to willingly bear one another's burdens for the sake of Christ. Whenever there is a true submission for the sake of the Lord, it leads to a frame of heart and an attitude that is penetrated with a deep sense of obligation. True submission seeks not to repudiate or dominate others in a relationship. Lesson point two, reflecting Christ's love for the church. Husbands are admonished to follow the example of Christ unconditionally and sacrificially serve the needs of their wives, spiritual, physical, psychological, emotional, economic, and material. This presents an analogy or concept of how to sacrificially express love for the sake of others. As a result of the grace of Christ's redemptive work of love, believers must act as workers together with him. Notable Scripture 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 Husbands are commanded to love their wives, Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 to 33 in review. The Greek word used in verse 25 for love is rooted in an understanding of a person who has an unconditionally subordinated, subordinated his or her own desires, inclinations, and personality for the benefit of others in a relationship context. It expresses an idea of an intention and activities that are based on virtues that encourage people to act by saving, building, and restoring others in love. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 and 27, the love that Christ expressed to fulfill God's divine purpose on earth is presented as being motivated by the sanctifying and cleansing of the church. Sanctification and cleansing of Christ's church lead to its glorification and splendor in the midst of a world system characterized by sin and darkness. This implies that in a marriage context, it is important to work toward values of purity and true spirituality of thoughts and actions, just as Christ's purpose for the church. From this perspective, the Christian household must learn to refrain from building its hope. Light on the word. The key word in this text is submission, 
and it lays a framework for a discussion on how to discharge Christian duties in dynamic relationships of mutuality in an act of true Christian spirituality. This idea put forth in the text suggests that the suggest the potential danger, the imagery of the marriage relationship, in which Adam declared Eve as the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh, proclaims forcefully a unique kind of spiritual and bodily union. It also declares an identification in which Adam's heart was prepared to love his wife. This means that without any reservation, he understood that his wife was part and parcel of his own spiritual, physical, psychological, and emotional living frame. This is an application of Jesus' second greatest commandment, that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Notable Scripture Matthew chapter 22, verse 39 in this case, one spouse is the closest neighbor, and each one should think of the other as he or she would of himself or herself. It gives a clear picture of how Christ loved the church, his own body, and laid down his life for it. Question 2. How are husbands to love their wives? Make sure to write down your answers. Light on the Word Jesus Christ expressed a sacrificial kind of love to the church when he laid down his life so that the church could be born, developed, and expanded. In Paul's epistle to the Philippians, he states that Christ restrained himself unselfishly from engaging in a lifestyle that would put personal glory over and above God's purpose. Christ out of love and devotion, had to make himself of no reputation so he could fully serve God's purpose for the church. Notable scripture, Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. The key motivation for his life was to fulfill God's purpose by serving the ultimate needs of God's people through a shameful redemptive death on the cross. Lesson point three. Children should be obedient and loved. Chapter 6 opens with a shift from the husband-wife relationship to the relationship between parents and children. In this context, Paul now lays out reciprocal duties and re responsibilities between parents and children. After you have believed, Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 of our lesson text in review. After discussing the husband-wife relationship, Paul now gives specific instructions to children. First, children were instructed to honor and obey their parents. Children have been instructed to honor thy father and mother through an appeal to Old Testament scriptures. This appeal is to reinforce the divine and ordered spiritual authority that has been structured from God's perspective. Obedience to parents is a commandment of God. Notable scriptures, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. Paul exhorts children to obey their parents in the Lord that is, in the spirit of obedience, as if they were obeying God. Paul also instructs children to obey their parents because it is the right thing to do. And according to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1-3, through 3, when a child honors, respects, and obeys his parents, that child is blessed. Just as children have a responsibility to obey their parents, Parents also have responsibilities to their children. In verse 4, Paul speaks specifically to fathers as the head of the family. He first gives the fathers a negative instruction. Do not exasperate your children. A father's role in his child's life ultimately impacts the child's concept of God the Father. Fathers, therefore, need to be watchful and consider how their behavior is influenced, 
influencing their child's actions. Unreasonable expectations, harsh or unfair punishment, or playing favorites will dishearten a child and can lead to disillusionment or rebellion. Instead of these behaviors, fathers are encouraged positively to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It is the father's responsibility to see that his children are being raised according to God's principles. Fathers are to nurture their children, to care for them tenderly, and to lead them gently into God's ways. The word admonition is related to training and instructing. Instructing, Therefore, parents are to give correction and instruction with the goal of developing their child's character and pointing the child toward righteousness. We give our children a great gift when we teach them early how to obey God and His Word. Question 3. How should a father treat his children? Make sure to write down your answers. The Bible Application Headship and Submission The Church, out of love, gratitude, and reverence, subjects itself to the Lord Jesus Christ as its head. It does this in compliance with God's authority. In the same vein, wives are instructed to submit in a marital relationship to the husband. They should do so in acknowledgement of the fact that God ordained the husband as the leader of the household. This divine arrangement is for the sake of producing ordered household conditions, which are necessary to bring glory to God's name and also bring peace and productivity to family life. This is God's pattern of true governance or leadership. Students' Responses The focus of this lesson has been on God's plan for spiritually healthy families. God laid out specific principles for loving, harmonious family life. When we live according to these principles, a godly family is a result, and a godly, harmonious family is a living testimony to Christ's love for the church. Whatever the makeup of your family, the principles of today's scriptures apply. It matters not if you are single or married if you live alone or in an extended family situation. The guidelines from Ephesians assure harmony and love in our families that mirror the will of God for the church. Dear Father, we ask you to help us demonstrate unconditionally the love of Christ to each member of our families. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Dig a little deeper. Family codes can be formal laws or unwritten norms and cultural practices that set the boundaries and define the decision-making power of men, women, boys, and girls in the household. Sometimes these codes are recorded, but often they are simply traditions, which may operate outside of the formal legal system. Every society has either formal or informal family codes. Carolyn Osiek, an emeritus professor of New Testament at the Divinity School at Texas Christian University, has a short discussion of the family codes we find in scripture. She directs our attention not only to the lesson text, but its companion passage, Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 18 and ending at Colossians chapter 4, verse 1, as well as 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 18 and ending at chapter 3, verse 7. Professor Osiek sees in these household codes a rejoinder to the family codes of the Roman world of the first century. The New Testament writers promoted the stability of the husband, wife, parent, child, and master-servant relationships in society, but in so doing they addressed the duties and responsibilities of the superiors as well as the subordinates. According to the apostles, husbands have a duty to their wives, fathers to their children, and even masters to slaves. It is important to note 
that although the writer is specific in using the word slave, the reference is making note to treatment of masters, leaders, to their servants or subordinates. The concept of mutual responsibility subtly undermined the patriarchy of Roman society. The dictatorial and overbearing nature of these secular relationships were transformed in the Christian context. You can read Professor Osiak's paper for a brief introduction to this fascinating topic. Our daily home Bible readings for the week. Monday, the topic is Praising God in Word and Life. Read Psalm 119 verses 169 through 176. Tuesday, the topic is Giving Glory to God. Read Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 16. Wednesday, the topic is Making the Word Fully Known. Read Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 through 29. Thursday, the topic is Sharing in the Gospel. Read Philippians chapter 1 verses 1 through 7. Friday, the topic is Speaking the Word with Boldness. Read Philippians chapter 1 verses 8 through 14. Saturday, the topic is Toiling to Proclaim the Gospel. Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. And on Sunday, the topic is Proclaiming Christ in Every Way. Read Philippians chapter 1 verses 15 through 26. The end. God bless you and thank you for joining me today.